Sorry, guys, I had to get my Red Bull. You guys feeling me, right? All right, guys, we're, we're about to have a fantastic conversation and one-on-one -on -one opportunity to speak to one of the brightest minds in, in the real estate business and marketing business. And one of the people who has, I, I just learned this the other day, spent $150 million over the last decade in marketing, marketing alone to build his businesses and build his teams. I want to introduce you guys to Mr. Robert Palmer. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How's everybody doing tonight? All right. I'd like to welcome All to the right. stage All the right. lyrically acclaimed. Woo. Ha. Woo. I like this young man because when he came out, he came out with the phrase. Yeah, guys, uh, marketing. You know, marketing is the primary reason anyone knows who I am, cares who I am, why I'm standing here today. Uh, a long time ago, I realized in our industries, whether that's mortgage, title, real estate, anything related to our service industry, we don't sell things. We don't have a product. We don't have a patent. So if you want to make yourself unique, if you want to build a business that can grow beyond your personal production, I realized the key to that was marketing. Because marketing is the thing that people can't take with you when they leave. You know, a team member leaves, they go start their own business. They start their own mortgage company, they start their own real estate team. They can do a lot of the same things you can do. But what they lose is access to the brand and the marketing that you built to help build your business. And so realizing that early on propelled me to a place to where at my peak, spending $25 million a year on TV and radio, and then one day waking up and realizing I didn't have to spend that much anymore. People knew who we were. We'd become a household name in a lot of markets. And so all those inbound calls kept coming even as we cut back the marketing. And so guess what happened? A big chunk of that $25 million a year became extra profit to the bottom line. And so there's a lot of things marketing will give you from freedom to build, freedom to scale, freedom to grow beyond your personal production, and ultimately the most lucrative path to profits. And so I'm excited to have a discussion here today with David, talk about some marketing, some things we see coming and changing right now in real estate marketing, because the market is changing. And uh, we're excited to share that with you today. All right, give him a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Guys, this is Robert. $150 million over 10 years is no small amount of money to market. How did this start for you? Because it didn't start with 25 million year one. How did it begin and how did it grow to that? Yeah, so direct mail was, was really where we, we got started. Uh, so, you know, winding back right after the financial crisis, I start my own company. I'd had some success working for other people. I'd save about $1.5 million, and I used that to launch my company. And we're a very regulated business. We had to keep that money in the business, so I couldn't touch it. So all that money was locked up. And so we had to figure out how are we going to maximize the profit we could make per deal because we were running on thin margins and the world was, was collapsing around us. This was 2008. And so I realized that by generating the marketing and going directly to the consumer, we could maximize those profits. We could put more of the money back in the company's pocket. And we started with direct mail. And the funny thing is, direct mail was expensive. And so my girlfriend at the time, now wife, and I literally would spend our nights running the copy machines, stuffing envelopes, and doing it ourselves. And we got up to where maybe we were doing, I don't know, 10,000 pieces of mail a week, which is a pretty good number. We That's would, a we huge play, number, by the way, you and wifey <laughs> doing it by yourselves. Yeah, uh, we, we would watch Halo 2 or play Halo 2 on the projector at night in the conference room while the printers ran, stuff the envelopes, get up the next morning, drive them to the post office. We figured out how to get the discounts by having them in the right order with the right barcodes and all this stuff. And we grew and grew. And then there was a direct mail company who we had gotten quotes from who went out of business. And so I went and bought their equipment and I brought it over to our office. And now we actually had some machines. So now all of a sudden we could do 50,000, 60,000, 70,000 pieces of direct mail a week. Again, me, my wife, and maybe another buddy at this point. And as we grew through direct mail, we realized that while it was great at driving direct response, people would call us, you know, we hit them over and over again, we had good messaging, they would call us, but there was always a skepticism. You know, I've never heard of your company before. I don't know who you are. I got this in my mailbox. I don't know if I can trust you. We didn't have the positioning. We didn't have the influence to convert, even though they responded to our message. And so we would say things like, well, you can check us out on the Better Business Bureau. You can check out our Google reviews, trying to quickly position ourselves, because that's another big part of marketing. Marketing isn't just about making the phone ring, and I had to learn this. It's about how you position yourself, how you grow your influence, so when they do respond to your messaging, they actually want to do business with you. 
And so I sat down, and I'm sitting around with my, again, now wife, and I'm like, you know, who do people really trust? And, and what I realized is the big brands, the big trusted brands are all on television. It's like magically, if you put a brand on TV, it becomes instantly trustworthy. And so I said, you know what, we're going to go on TV. I had no idea what I was doing. Got some books, read up on it, went to the TV stations, got some quotes. And uh, we read our fir ran our first set of TV commercials, and it totally bombed. You know, we ran the interest rate, we ran the website, no response, because it didn't build the credibility. I was still stuck in make the phone ring, direct response mode, and that's not what TV was built for. And so we went back, and we retooled the commercials, decided I would be in them. I think I was maybe 29 at the time. I'm like, nobody's going to trust me. I shouldn't be in the commercials. I had really long sideburns at the time. I look back on those commercials, and I laugh. Uh, <laughs> but we did it. And we actually ran that first commercial during Sunday Night Football in Orlando. And we got the TV station to let me introduce the game. And so I said something like, I'm Robert Palmer, president of RP Funding, and we're proud to sponsor NBC's NFL Sunday Night Football here on West 2. And I had the football logo next to me. And the commercial did OK, but what we did is we took a screenshot of that commercial and we put it in our mailers. So then every mail that went out said, hey, you probably saw me on TV introducing Sunday Night Football last week. And so whether they actually saw it or not, the credibility and the positioning and the place it put us in the market, guess what? All of a sudden, those phone calls, they weren't asking if we were legit anymore. They weren't asking, can I trust you? I've never heard of you. They said, oh my god, you, were, you introduced Sunday Night Football, whether they saw the game or not. And so by realizing that marketing was not just about response, it was about response and positioning and influence was a major breakthrough for me. And so we went from there, and we reinvested more and more and more profits into the advertising. I kept driving a crappy old car and living in an apartment while I'm spending, at this point, maybe $15 million a year on advertising. That's money I could have been putting in my pocket, but I put it back in the business. And I created this snowball to where the brand became so big that I have the financial empire I do today where my kids and my kids' kids are taken care of, all from marketing. Now, there was a lot of hard work and systems and things along the way, but the biggest differentiator between me and a lot of other people who tried to do the same thing was the marketing. You said something pretty impressive. You said, I still lived in the same small apartment, crappy car, and I was spending $15 million a year in marketing. And there's many people in here and many real estate agents, maybe 95% of real estate agents, that never reinvest in themselves in such fashion. What, gives you, what gave you that discipline to want to do that? And what piece of advice would you give agents so that they can have a shift in their mindset and say, I need to put money back into myself consistently and keep driving this crappy car? Yeah, I think uh, I had really lofty goals. You know, I really wanted to accomplish a lot. And I knew if I made myself too comfortable, you know, well, hey, maybe I'll get a little bit nicer car, or maybe I'll get a little bit nicer apartment, maybe I'll buy that house in the middle. I knew that once I ripped that Band-Aid off, it was gonna be really hard to keep grinding. It was gonna be really hard to keep showing up and stuffing envelopes and working as hard as I was and putting everything back in. And so by purposely keeping myself uncomfortable, by purposely not giving in to that self-reward, that gratification for longer, I was able to push more money back into the business so then when I hit a point where I finally did start taking chips off the table, there were a whole lot of chips to take off the table. And one of the best decisions I ever made. You know, my wife almost left me at the time, my girlfriend. She's like, are we ever going to stop this? You know, I was always the optimist. Like, hey, a couple more years of this, it's going to be great. She's like, you've been telling me that for five years. You know, like, when is it ever going to be enough? And honestly, she probably got me off the hamster wheel a little earlier than I would have. Um, I may still be doing it and living in a crappy apartment. It's just who I am. Um, but we did. You know, I finally started taking some chips off the table. Uh, started growing the business at a more reasonable rate, but all that early investment and that early delayed gratification and putting it all back into marketing, that was our primary spend, putting the money back into marketing because that was my moat, that was my protection, that was the fortress that I was building that no one could take, with me, you know, take from me when they left. That is what I controlled, which became the foundation for the entire companies. This is going to be one of the, probably the most important questions I ask you today because marketing has shifted, it's changed. And there are a lot of people out there saying TV doesn't work anymore because no one watches TV. Everyone is on social media now. So how do you answer the print marketing, the TV radio, and the digital marketing campaigns that are out there? What's your answer to today's marketing? What still works? How does it work? And is TV and radio still relevant? Yeah, so I think in a way you answered your own question because everybody is on social media. Right? There's nothing unique about seeing my face 
on Facebook or seeing my face on Instagram or seeing my face on TikTok. Everyone with a profile has their face in all of those places. Whose face is on the cover of a printed magazine? You know, industry titans, celebrities. Whose face shows up on your television? You know, whose face and whose voice shows up on radio and billboards? And so I think while there, yes, there are less people watching, for those who do, the positioning and the influence that it creates is still unmatched. There's absolutely a place for digital. You know, look, I think it's a lot of the same thing. I would run something like, you probably saw me introduce Sunday Night Football on TV on a digital ad, right? Let's go reach those people, but remind them who we are. Take out a billboard, take a picture of that billboard, run that billboard on social media. Hey, you're not just seeing my face on social media, you're seeing a picture of my billboard because I have more credibility and more influence in a better position than just someone with a headshot. I have a billboard and here's a picture of it, let me show it to you. Subconsciously, you are taking the customer to a different place, whether that's in your sphere, whether that's a cold contact, whatever it looks like. And so I think the positioning and influence piece of it was very, very important. You know, and, and as you talk about things changing, and we are in the middle of a, a massive shift right now, um, I like to fish, right? And so we're actually, I'm having a mastermind on my boat tomorrow down in uh, South Beach Marina. I like to fish. And as someone who likes to fish, you spend a lot of time figuring out what kind of lure am I gonna use? What kind of line am I gonna use? What's my hook gonna look like? Because in normal conditions, all that needs to be perfect. Your skills need to be perfect to have success. But every now and then you find yourself in a situation of what's called a feeding frenzy, where the fish are just going crazy. And the fish are so crazy in these feeding frenzies, they will literally eat a blank hook. You can throw a blank hook into the water, no lure, no bait, no skill, none of those things we spend hours and hours honing and still catch all the fish you want. And that is what the real estate market has been for the last two years. We were in a feeding frenzy. You could throw a blank hook into the water and catch fish the last two years in real estate. Now we're getting back to a regular market where you better have the right lure and the right line and the right hook and the right skill. And there are a lot of agents out there still throwing that empty hook in the water and wondering why it's not catching anything today. It worked yesterday, it worked a year ago, it worked two years ago because we were in a feeding frenzy. The feeding frenzy is over and now it's time to get back to business. We were able to be lazy as marketers during these periods. We had all these people moving to Florida from other states. They didn't know any real estate agents. They would click on the first ad they saw and hire someone. You didn't need the influence. You didn't need the positioning that you're going to need now. The feeding frenzy is over. It's time to get serious. And getting serious about marketing is how you bait that hook. It's how you catch that customer. It's how you build your business. And I believe that in this period of time, when things are changing, and skills are needed, and tools are needed, we are going to see the next generation of top teams be created. You see, whenever there's a problem like this, whenever there's a slowdown, whenever there's a dip, is what creates opportunity. And so for a lot of you, you've actually been at a disadvantage. If you're a top producer, you've been at a disadvantage for the last couple of years because the guy with the blank hook throwing it in the water was having the same results you were because we were in a feeding frenzy. And so I believe that the next couple of years are going to produce the next generation of top teams. The teams who can figure out how to leverage that marketing, how to bait that hook correctly, how to build that business so that when things do turn around, they have an army of agents who they've taught how to fish. And my personal goal is to help find those people and help them build those teams so we can all fish together as we come out of this downturn into the next big market. Awesome. Now we're running out of time, so this is gonna be my last question, and it's a question that I love to ask, especially when I'm speaking to someone that has found so much success. What has been one of the biggest hiccups that you've had? I don't use the word failures. So yeah. what's one of the biggest hiccups that you had, and how did you found, find the way to surpass it and continue? Yeah, so I think for me, early on, we were having all this success. We were seeing results through marketing that were not in line with the overall market. So while the overall market maybe wasn't going up, we were, and, and I had this false sense of genius that I had cracked the code, I had figured it out, we were going to beat the cyclical nature of our business. You know, mortgage, very cyclical, three to four year cycles. Real estate, not quite as cyclical, usually seven to 10 year cycles. We've had a little bit extra time on this last cycle because the bust was so bad in 2008, but cycles are a part of this business. And not understanding that, or maybe understanding it, but forgetting it, and thinking that I was better than the cycles. 
because no matter who you are or how good you are, the cycles do matter, and the cycles will impact your business. And it tripped me up. We grew too fast, we grew into a boom, we had to lay people off. This was back in 2013. I almost lost everything because I leaned into a cycle not realizing it was the cycle that drove my success as much as it was my own skills. And this is what we're seeing right now in real estate. A lot of big companies leaned into the cycle. They leaned into the last 24 months. They staffed up, they got new offices, they gave themselves raises, they bought new cars, and now reality is back and things are getting tough. And so the best thing I learned through that experience is the entire time you're living in a boom cycle, you should be thinking and preparing for the next bust. And then the entire time you're in that bust cycle, you should be thinking and preparing for the next boom. Because if you live in the cycle you're in today, you are just counting the days until that strategy blows up in your face. We are a cyclical business. There are cycles that will change. Always be looking to the next side of the cycle as you build and prepare your business. Awesome. Round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Guys, Robert Palmer is an amazing marketer and businessman. Who would like to spend more time with him? See, Robert said he's going to host a private mastermind on his boat tomorrow. Let me correct him. He's going to host a private mastermind on his yacht tomorrow. Okay? Um, and topics are definitely going to include everything that he's discussing right now, the marketing and how to be beyond production and how to develop stronger and, and more uh, profitable businesses. This is not something that he opens up often. We had a conversation. I said, I did this last year in Jersey. Will you do this with me this year? He was like, hell yeah, man, let's do it. I'm pulling the boat up to Miami Beach Marina. Let's rock and roll. How many of you would like to be a part of that? All right, so where's Tracy? Where's the lovely Tracy? You see Tracy over there waving her, her booklet around? All you gotta do is talk to Tracy. She's gonna take your information. She'll let you know if you qualify to come. This is a pretty big deal, guys. I've had multiple conversations with Robert over the last few months, and it's been an amazing, amazing opportunity. I've learned a lot in just the last few months, and we want to offer that to you guys. So thank you, Robert, for being giving at this yeah, place. Thank you, man. And if you can't catch Tracy, you can stop by Premier Home Loans uh, or Home Team Lending or Mortgage Advisors Boost. They have signups as well. Thank you all for having a little bit of your time. Look forward to seeing some of you on the boat tomorrow, and good luck in your businesses. All right. Thanks.